All right. Well, uh, good afternoon to everybody, to our guests joining in Israel. Tov. Thank you so much for being here with us. I'm so delighted to kick off um, this afternoon session focused on clean water access and sanitation. Um, as we kind of look around some of even the, the recent and unfortunate news and the, the geopolitics of natural resources, I think we can certainly understand how important um, water is to our, to our uh, future um, and the larger topic of in the environment and sustainability. I'm joined by three incredible panelists and I think uh, an amazing way to begin is just to ask each of them in turn to briefly introduce themselves. Um, before we do, I, uh, uh, my name is Eve Klein. I'm a general partner here at Landmark Ventures. Um, I just wanna extend my gratitude to Hebrew University and the American Friends of Hebrew University uh, for extending me and us this invitation. And so uh, with that, maybe Dr. Uh, Rich Thorsten, we can ask you to begin. Um, we recognize and appreciate, of course, that you're the Chief Insight Officer at Water.org. Perhaps you can give us just a, a little bit more of a sense in terms of some of the work that you're focused on um, and, and kind of, you know, where, where you guys are seeing some of the, 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 the new trends in terms of, again, clean water and sanitation. Yeah, thank you, Ziv, um, and, and thank you so much for the opportunity to participate in the panel uh, today and this evening. Um, I am Rich Thorsten, uh, Chief Insights Officer at Water.org. Um, I've been at Water.org now, for, this is my 15th year at Water.org, uh, or about roughly half of the organization's existence at, the, at this point. Um, Water.org is really focused on um, solving the water and sanitation crisis. And our, our key focus is really thinking about um, financing and the importance of financing and investment, um, bringing in different forms of financing to address this, this global uh, crisis that we have um, here in the world. And I'm happy to talk more about that, but uh, maybe I'll stop there uh, for introduction purposes. Thank you so much. Um, Sivan, if you don't mind, um... Uh, as we can see in your signature as well, founder and CEO of Innovation Africa, would love to hear from you next. Thank you, Ze'ev. Hello, everyone, and thank you for including me in this panel. Uh, my name is Sivan, and uh, a few years ago, I founded Innovation Africa. It's a charity, and it has a very simple mission to bring Israeli technologies to African villages. And basically what we do, we're using solar energy to pump water in remote villages across Africa. I'm pleased to say that as of today, we have helped about 700 villages, 3 million people, but as many of you know, it's still quite little compared to the current challenge that exists across Africa, where over 400 million people need water. So I'm very happy to be here and, and continue the discussion about the importance of water, um, especially in those remote villages where people are just not reaching. So, thank Wonderful. you. Wonderful, thank you, perfect. Um, Professor Ron Fadelson, um, an honor to have you chair of the Environmental uh, Studies um, uh, inside the Department of Geography at Hebrew University. Um, same question, if you don't mind, uh, would you be able to introduce your work and kind of your focus on this topic? Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm at the faculty of Hebrew University now for over 30 years. Uh, I've actually been uh, founded and been head of the Advanced School for Environmental Studies, which is a, a supra faculty um, a school. And before that, I was uh, head of the uh, Federman School for Public Policy and Governance. And before that, I was chair of geography. So I've been around for a while. Um, I deal with water, as, it's one of my fields, I've also other fields, but in, in terms of water, my focus is on policy. Uh, that's kind of the common thread. Uh, I've worked on uh, transboundary water, but it began with um, the Israeli-Palestinian issues, uh, the joint management of shared aquifers back in the, before Oslo still, I mean, I'm talking 30 years ago. And uh, I've been working on a lot of, of the conceptualizations of water. Uh, what is the meaning of water, uh, and in also including the implications of technology from a policy and politics uh, perspective, uh, most lately on, on the issues of uh, desalination and uh, wastewater recycling. So but we'll talk about that later on. Wonderful. So thank you. Thank you so much for the group. Um, maybe we could ask uh, either Rich or Sivan or both of you to help us set the stage as we look out into kind of the global public health um, kind of environment. 
what do you see as some of the challenges? Why, why is this dialogue and discussion about water and sanitation so important? Uh, I guess I can start and Sivan, um, feel free to, to come in after, after, I, after I finish. Um, so we're, 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 living, we're living in the midst of, of an ongoing uh, global water and sanitation crisis that often doesn't get um, you know, the same news and attention um, on the world stage. Um, there's over 800 million people that lack uh, basic access to water, um, over 2 billion that uh, lack access to any form of sanitation in the world today. Um, it's an ongoing public health crisis. Every 90 seconds or so, a child dies uh, as a result of inadequate um, or unsafe water. Um, and so it's, it's an ongoing uh, public health crisis. Um, and like other public health crises, um, it's a mix of uh, you know, failures of governance, failures of management, and, 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 a, and a lack of resources. And, and as I mentioned at the top, water.org really focuses on that last category, um, looking for ways to catalyze public and private sector investment into this space. Um, that's critical because um, in order for us to meet uh, sustainable development goal number six, which is really focused on water and sanitation access, it's gonna take at least three times the amount of current investment. Um, we have a tremendous billions of dollars uh, gap in um, investment. And that's just, a couple, that's just to cover the capital costs associated with universal access. That doesn't even include operational needs and the impacts of climate change and other natural disasters. Um, so I think that that, that you know, helps set the stage globally for the nature of the crisis that we're dealing with. Sivan? Yes, I, I would like to agree, but also not to disagree with Rich, but say something that is a bit different, which is water exists, actually. There is plenty of it. But in order to reach the water, you need energy. And the challenge that we have today is the lack of energy. Because there is no energy, people do not have access to clean water. Because as a, as a charity, what we do, like uh, water.org, we're focusing on, on finding simple solutions. And let me tell you, based on our own experience, it is quite simple. Each time we drill, we find water. Sometimes we're gonna find water 50 meters deep, sometimes 200 meters deep, it's okay. But when we drill, we find water and a lot of it. The challenge that we have, and Africa has, that's where we operate, over 600 million people do not have access to energy. And if you don't have energy, you cannot pump the water. And this is the challenge. So I believe that actually, if we can solve the energy challenge, then everything will, will get better. Mm -hmm. In schools, there is no electricity. So you cannot have good education. In medical centers, you don't have electricity, no energy. So there are no refrigerators for vaccines. You cannot power medical equipment because there is no energy. And as I said, and most importantly, because there is no energy, there is no water, and this is the challenge. Thank you for that. I think that's a that's a fascinating framing um, to you know take our mind away from what we would consider you know just kind of cold water, move it now to this dialogue around energy. Um, I suspect we could very quickly go from energy to financial resources, from financial resources to human resources. Uh, uh, Iran, Dr. Fadelson, uh, we had at the top of the hour uh, agreed that we can refer in, in a first person, so we'll, we'll or first name, so we'll, we'll use the more congenial uh, approach. Um, you had a, in, initially talked about it from a policy and a politics perspective. Perhaps you can illuminate, as you see it, maybe from a macro environment, how does you know, the, 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 the precious resource of water factor into geopolitics? Um, and maybe I'll continue and then I'll jump into the geopolitics. Uh, essentially, the issue of water is uh, governance uh, to a great extent. Uh, I'll give an example. We were um, with the Faculty of Agriculture and the University of Maryland in Baghdad in Ethiopia, uh, which sits on Lake Tana, which is the source of the Blue Nile. It sits on the source of the Blue Nile. I mean, they have water as much as you can just imagine. Uh, yet they don't have water. Um, and uh, when we were there, they take water actually from springs and the pumps don't work because there's no electricity and we asked them about generators and they have generators, but no spare parts. So it, it comes down sometimes to uh, these level uh, of issues. 
And about 20 years ago, exactly 20 years ago, I wrote a paper about water poverty. And I defined water poverty as a, a situation where a region or a country uh, cannot afford the cost of a clean, sustainable water to all people at all time. And the word all is always important because it is often the marginal populations uh, and certain periods in, year, in the year when the problems arise. So I think that is uh, really the challenge uh, and often it, and that has to do with governance. And uh, to take one more point, it is not just the supply, it's the maintenance, uh, which is like the Bahadal example. It is, uh, it's not enough to build a system. Uh, a place like Ethiopia has many uh, kind of signs where you see that you know different things have been done, they just stopped operating. And this is even worse when you got, get into sanitation and wastewater. Uh, because wastewater treatment is something that is very difficult to maintain. It's biological systems. Uh, and so uh, the issue when you get into sanitation is much more complex than water. I mean, we say water and sanitation, these are two very different cases with very different challenges. And the sanitation is what is much more difficult than the clean water actually. So uh, it's not as if it's just one and the other. Uh, in a country like Israel, it is. Now, as for geopolitics, I know it is often framed as, you know, war, uh, there were all kinds of uh, uh, things that were said, you know, the next war will be about water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. No, uh, uh, there were never water wars. There are no water wars and there will not be water wars. Um, because if you think about it, the cost of producing of water is, is negligible uh, when you compare it to the cost of, of conflict. So uh, there are conflicts over water. They're usually intra-country, they're not uh, uh, between countries, and uh, there will not be a water war. Uh, uh, water is really a public health issue and uh, a humanitarian issue. It is not, the, the issue is not the geopolitics. Uh, there is local politics, and that is an issue. Uh, so one should separate what is and isn't. Thank you for that. That's a fascinating uh, reply. Um, and so I think we also heard from you that water is governance and water is maintenance. So I think we're learning a lot about things that water is. Um, Rich, if you don't mind, I'll bring it back to you. Um, we, we, and thank you, by the way, um, I took some notes, 800 million people globally without water, um, 2 billion without sanitation. Every 90 second, a baby dies, which is unbelievably heart-wrenching. Um, uh, that's about 40 deaths during the, the length of our panel, which is just un unfathomable. Um, Perhaps we can maybe turn the page a little bit from maybe the problems and the challenges to some of the solutions or opportunities that um, you might be seeing. Um, kind of how does water.org approach this? Um, we've had a little bit of framing in terms of water winds up almost being a systems issue. Um, it is not just a singular issue. It has some kind of support services or, or other needs that, uh, that surround it. How do you guys approach it? Um, uh, kind of what, what kind of innovations are you seeing kind of out, out in the field at this point? Yeah, thanks. Um, so I, I, I mentioned that uh, that water and sanitation issues uh, involve several dimensions. There's governance, there's management. Certainly there are um, important inputs like energy that are required um, in order to be successful. Um, and there's and there's resources and, and financing. Um, and and we, re we really focus on uh, the financing component um, given the um, water and sanitation is, uh, we, are, we, we are a charity, but in many ways we consider ourselves a social enterprise. And, and, and much of that is because um, there will never be enough charity in the world uh, to solve the global water and sanitation crisis. What's needed is a combination of public investment, philanthropic investment, and private investment. And we've really focused on ways to catalyze various forms of investment. So um, probably our signature example of that is what we call water credit. Um, water credit is effectively a mechanism by which we work with financial institutions to develop small-scale uh, water and sanitation loans um, that uh, people in uh, villages and communities in urban uh, settlements around the world uh, can take out and repay over a period of time uh, in order to gain water and sanitation access. Um, under, that, um, under that approach, which we've been um, 
leading the way on over the last 15 years. Uh, there's been over 40 million people that have benefited around the globe uh, from that activity. Um, and from that, uh, we've, we've had some other initiatives emerge as well. So um, we've created a, a social impact investment um, firm called Water Equity. It's the first impact investment firm that's dedicated specifically to water and sanitation access and improvements. They have about $160 million in assets under management. Their goal is to take that to a billion in the next few years. So um, some pretty significant aspirational goals. Um, and then another area that we tend to focus on is uh, policy and practice change. So Aaron, you mentioned the importance of governance and policy um, here. We believe that there um, are significant barriers to investment and uh, impact um, that are needed to uh, overcome or opportunities to promote in the public sector uh, that can generate uh, more of the capital um, and the impact required uh, to meet the need of the, of the WASH crisis. So those are many of the areas that we that we tend to focus our work on. Thank you so much. Um, and summarizing a little bit from your perspective, we uh, learned that uh, uh, water can be finance um, and can be kind of uh, maybe repackaged in terms of some of the credit and other financial instruments or social impact instruments you're using. Um, Sivan, I want to bring the same question now back to you as we think about innovation. Um, you mentioned your focus on energy. Um, I, I'm, we're previously acquainted and I'm, I'm a great admirer of yours and the work that you've done. Um, what, what would you like people to know about how your operations in Africa not only affect people's lives, but how you're really pioneering change on the ground, be that technological change or be that change within these communities? Thank you, Zev. Uh, the truth, what I really want to share with the audience is that the solution is actually quite simple. When you think about it, the energy exists because the sun exists. And by using only a few solar panels, we are able to provide enough energy to power a pump. The pump is then pumping water that exists right there and plenty of it and large aquifers and clean water. And so what we are doing is, is really nothing special. And we're able to do it quickly. We're able to do it in a relatively low cost. It cost about $50,000 to change a village of about five to 10,000 people. And that cost of $50,000 includes the drilling, the construction of a large tower, the reserve, the, the tank, the pump, the solar panels, and the network of pipes, pipings like up to four kilometers and taps across the village. It's a one-time cost. And earlier, Professor Iran talked about maintenance. I agree with him. If you use a generator with fuel, you have to buy fuel. People don't have money for it. But if you're using the solar panels and solar energy, which is free, it is much better, more reliable, and of course, affordable. And so what we do, Ziev, uh, since you have asked how we operate, when we get to a village, we're engaging with the community. They are electing a water committee. They even open a bank account. We select 10 people from the village to work with the contractor for three months. We pay them, we train them, they work with the contractor. By the time we leave the village, we have a water committee, which has a bank account, and every household give a certain amount of money to the bank account. Now, the money is to be used for two things, to pay for a guard, to guard the solar panels, and to pay for the operator. So it's true that charity is not the solution. I agree, it is absolutely not. But in some regions where people cannot afford to pay for water. At that, at that time, we feel that we cannot find other solution than bringing a few solar panels, drilling in, pumping water, and allowing people to actually have a better life. Because once they have water, everything changes. Thank you so much, Sivan. That was a, an incredible um, a summary and articulation of really the, the ecosystem that you've built, where it's not just, you know, one singular solution, you've, you've really built something that, that is sustainable and systemic, uh, which I think is an incredible way to approach the topic. Um, a quick note that um, while I do have a few more questions and quite frankly, I can, I can go all day, uh, for those in the audience, please do use the chat, the Q&A function to ask questions. We've seen a few come in 
uh, be taking notes and we'll be uh, relaying that. And so uh, as I go through my questions, to the extent that you have yours, uh, we very much encourage this to be a dialogue. Uh, while I won't attribute it to someone unless you wish to be attributed, um, I will certainly reference that it's an audience question coming in. Um, uh, uh, Iran, if you don't mind coming back to you for a moment, um, we heard a little bit from Rich and Sivan, and, and I guess one of my questions would be, based on kind of your seat at Hebrew University, sitting where you sit in terms of kind of an, maybe a, an Israeli lens, so to speak, what role do you see Israel playing? To, to, in many cases, I think there's, you know, this story of Israel being a water pioneer um, out of the gate at the country's formation. I believe today we're certainly in the business of also exporting technology, uh, be that desalinization or other types of um, innovations. And so kind of curious, um, and, and after you answer, please, to the rest of the group, if you'd want to contribute, where do you see kind of Hebrew University slash Israel play a role as we think of kind of solving some of the clean water and sanitation issues? So, um, I mean, uh, Israel is a water leader uh, in the world. I mean, I was uh, just before COVID in uh, San Diego and I was talking, comparing Israel and California and Israel is much more advanced than California. Actually, the diesel plant in California is operated by uh, Israelis. So uh, the, the picture is that Israel is a And leader. solar, right, Sivan? We're also leaders in solar. We'll talk about that in a moment. Also in solar <laughs> and, and in, if we're talking about technology, we're talking here today more about uh, water supply and uh, public health, but once remember that most of the water in the world is used for irrigation. And right, drip course, irrigation yes. there is, of course, uh, the big, uh, is the big yeah. um, And, and uh, Israel is really, we're way ahead in the sense that we've made the combination of desalination and wastewater recycling. But must remember that uh, waste, uh, that desalination also you have sweeter water, which means you have more water for wastewater recycling, which is sweeter and which we can use for a wider array of crops as a result. So uh, this combination really changes, is a game changer. I mean, Israel today is largely decoupled from climate. Uh, that is, if we have a drought, it doesn't make a difference because, uh, and, and actually now, let's say, it, the days we're speaking, as we're speaking, uh, we have all the reservoirs full and the recycled wastewater we're putting into the streams because we don't have storage for them. Uh, and um, in this sense, uh, that's really, you know, and, and you, the whole waterscape and geography has changed. Water flows from the sea inland and is recycled. So it's, we're talking about a completely new world in terms of water. The point is, what of that can be taken over? And, and what, I mean, the things that Sivan was talking about, they are wonderful, but they are the village level. One must remember that the main issues are, today we're in an urban world, uh, Africa less, other, Part of the world more, but we're today in an urban world. And when you talk about mega cities, the mega cities are in the developing countries, and there you have huge problems uh, in the mega cities. And there you would need to get uh, ultimately to desalination. Now today we see desalination being uh, diffused. We have also we've written about the diffusion of desalination. It is being diffused today to middle income and lower middle income uh, countries. Uh, but that does not solve all the problems because you have the landlocked countries. Uh, not everyone is near the sea. And uh, you still have the sanitation issue. And one must remember when you concentrate people, that is the mega cities, then you concentrate also this. And when you do build the sanitation, you create a pollution problem because you concentrate the ways, uh, the, the sewage, unless it's treated. And then you get to the treatment issue and the wastewater issues which are much, as I said, are much more difficult and, and complex. So this is where the, we're coming in. Now, Israel, in the Faculty of Agriculture, we have a lot of people working on, on wastewater recycling. Uh, and that's really the state of the art. So I think Hebrew University is, is really a leader in these issues of, of wastewater recycling. And we're doing a lot of work. But that was also the reason better why we were in Ethiopia at that time. Though in Ethiopia, we can't talk about wastewater recycling because there's no sewage because it's still at the septic tank level. So if you don't have a sanitation system, you don't have anything to recycle. And, and it, has, it goes back also to, to the quantities of water. So we're, Hebrew University is really in, on the state of the art. We're talking about these issues. We're studying these issues. We're proposing issues. The issue, the problem is it affects only kind of middle income and lower middle income countries and, and upwards. But when you get to 
uh, you know, to the Central African Republic, uh, it is in, in not pertinent to it. And so there it's a completely different ball game that uh, you need. And, and the point I think in the world is to separate what type of solutions fits what type, which type of places. There's a difference between humid countries and arid countries or semi-arid countries. There's a difference between the rural sector and the urban sector. There's a difference between uh, mid, uh, what we call the emerging economies and uh, or the bottom billion, which is uh, another term you know, for these countries, which are the ones that were left behind, like the Central African Republic or Afghanistan or these kind of places. So one has to tailor solutions to different circumstances. And so we can try to, to fit uh, uh, which types of solution uh, fits which type of places. And I think that's part of the game. And it's kind of the things we're working on on the policy side, but uh, I can't say that we're sort of, you know, providing answers to everybody everywhere. Uh, no, it is, it is, the problem is much more multidimensional uh, than that. Yeah. Thank, thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> I'd love to build on that and, and uh, maybe uh, shift gears slightly to think a little bit about um, partnerships. Um, there is a uh, an African proverb that I think about often, which is if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Um, and I think that to solve some of the issues that we've been addressing, it probably does require us to go far. And, and in going far does require us to go together. Uh, Rich, I'm sure that you guys have a lot of different partnerships under your belt. And as you think about be that um, public, private sector, et cetera, um, perhaps Yvonne, we start with you. Maybe just share with us a little bit about as you imagine kind of the landscape um, in Innovation Africa. Where have you seen partnerships succeed? Where have you seen partnerships fail? And then Rich will kind of uh, defer the same question to you. I suspect you'll have certain things to share that have similarity, but given maybe that you're dealing with financial partnerships, maybe versus different type of operating partnerships, there may be some differences there. Um, and so Sivan, please. Yes, thank you, Sam. Um, of course, over the years, we had uh, the privilege to partner with a few organizations. One of them is UNICEF. Uh, we're currently working with UNICEF in Cameroon, helping refugee camps, uh, refugees that are fleeing Nigeria and entering Cameroon. And that, that was a, a great partnership. Uh, but sometimes it didn't work. Uh, you know, some partnership does, don't work. And, and it's happened to me at the beginning when we first started partnering with local NGOs. And it's quite, quite difficult because what we do requires a lot of engineering knowledge. And so over the years, I realized that even if we want to partner, we still need to have our own team on the ground. And as of today, we have over 100 employees in Africa in six countries. All of them are engineers. Many of them were trained here in Israel. And our team members that are water engineers, electrical engineers, hydrologists, civil engineers, are really the one that are there and help with the supervision of the construction and train the relevant people. So we can partner with other organizations, but at the same time, I do, based on my own experience, I do believe that actually still being quite involved uh, in, in, in the project is important for the sustainability of the project. And I do want to say we talked about technology, Zev, if I can say one more thing that we bring from Israel. Can I? Yes, please. Because I think it's, I think people will appreciate it. Because we are dealing with remote villages, many people do not want to donate to something that they don't know what's happening with it because it's far away because some donors cannot travel with us. So from Israel or here in this office in, in Tel Aviv, we are invented a monitoring system, remote monitoring system, allowing us and the donors to monitor lives, how much water we are pumping at every village at any moment. So if you, Zeev, would like to adapt a village, we're going to give you a list of villages, we're going to do the project, and once it's completed, you're going to be able to know on your phone, you're going to have a satellite view of the village, you can see where the taps are, where the stand is, and also you will be able to see how much water has been pumped, 
And if something breaks, you will get an alert. And I think this is important. The transparency is important. Understanding that it's still operating is crucial. And I think that's what keeps us going is because we understand that what we do works and if it breaks, we can go and fix it. Thank you for that. Yeah, I think um, that's a great point around, um, even in partnerships, the responsibility to maintain presence, but also to maintain accountability reporting. I think a lot of times people maybe complete and disappear. There's a little bit of a kind of, you know, parachute philanthropy that may um, happen. Um, and I think, you know, maintaining that continuity is, is probably very much a key to success, both for you and for others. Um, so thank you so much for that answer. Rich, perhaps uh, we can kind of uh, route the question to you. Um, uh, I imagine that there's probably some similarities, but also some differences in terms of your world and Sivan's world. Yeah, so it's interesting um, to, to listen to um, uh, Sivan uh, outline some of uh, her key partnerships with Innovation Africa. Um, our organization was, was formerly known as Water Partners when we got our start in 1990. So partnerships have been part and parcel and core to our model of operation ever since the beginning. Um, and in fact, for the first 15, 20 years of our of, of our existence, we were largely focused on uh, community level water supply and sanitation systems in villages. Um, so that's where we really got our start um, as an organization. And many of those partnerships were with NGOs. Uh, Starting about 15 years ago, we also began working with financial institutions, um, kind of in the manner that I described um, uh, in terms of microfinance. Um, and so we've worked with microfinance institutions and, and now a broader array of financial institutions um, over, uh, over the last 10, 15 years as an organization. Um, I think that there are uh, also tremendous opportunities as we, as we look at uh, how to continue to find innovative ways to solve the water and sanitation crisis to work in other sectors as well. Um, I think the housing sector, uh, there's a nice complement between water and sanitation um, and housing. Um, I think climate um, is another important area. There's, there's a lot of interest and investment in climate, uh, climate objectives and climate financing. And many of those um, goals can be directly tied to water and sanitation access and, and ongoing services. Um, I think a little bit about, um, you know, beyond the uh, traditional microfinance institutions and domestic financial institutions we work with, another type of financial institution that we haven't worked with as much, but I think holds some promises is, is longer term investors like uh, pensions and, and insurance funds. Um, these, these institutions tend to look for stable uh, but predictable uh, returns over uh, a long period of time. And that is right for um, longer term investments in water and sanitation infrastructure, which do take time um, in order to generate returns on investment. So under the right conditions, um, matching um, infrastructure opportunities with longer term investors is an area where we think uh, is, is going to prove um, you know, to be important um, as we look at various sources of capital that are needed needed for various needs, um, not just the initial capital investment, but also longer term operations as well. Thank you for that. That was, uh, again, a very strong and compelling answer. Um, Iran, if you don't mind, we have uh, two audience questions. We're going to package both of them. I, I believe you probably would um, have, have comfort with, with them. Uh, one was with regards to the Dead Sea in Israel and a question regarding its kind of longevity and sustainability. And the second is with regards to immigration. To what extent do you see um, water begin to affect immigration patterns, be that in the Middle East or in other parts of the world, as perhaps you know, cost of water, availability of water, et cetera? Um, uh, do you do you see people, you know, either forcibly being uprooted or, you know, to the extent they can financially afford it, elect to be uprooted and move towards, you know, higher higher water um, access regions? Well, actually, uh, about the Dead Sea. We are just, I'm, I'm just now involved in a, a proposal. They were just formulating it, which has to do with a, what I mentioned before, the desalination, because today Israel is already connecting the Sea of Galilee to desal. That is, we're reversing the national water carrier completely. Uh, so far it's been reversed in the coastal plain, now it's being uh, reversed completely. So also the Sea of Galilee will receive desalinated seawater. Now the question is, what, how, what are the quantities? Right now we're talking about 200 million cubic meters. 
But if we go up to something like 1 billion cubic million cubic meters, that's a game changer because one must remember the partnership here, you know, you were asking about partnerships. So the partnerships I was involved in were with the Palestinians and with the Jordanians uh, already for 30 years. So I've been involved in these kind of partnerships. And uh, the big issue uh, in the Middle East, there's two countries which are really water scarce or water poor, which are uh, Yemen and Jordan. And uh, Jordan is, is again the case of the landlocked, though it has Aqaba, but it is virtually landlocked, all the population in the, the northern half, and it is a thousand meters above sea level. So uh, they're in a dire strait, and they have about 2 million refugees uh, of, of Iraqis and, and Syrians there in addition to the population. So Jordan is the name of the game. And so this whole point is to bring water to Jordan. And then also one can talk about the Dead Sea because you can't bring water to the Dead Sea without addressing the issue of uh, Jordan, of, of Yerbid and Amman, mainly Amman. Uh, so that is the kind of proposal we're now working on, uh, how to address really uh, the Dead Sea, but, on, but first of all, Jordan and then the Dead Sea including the possibilities of, of recycling a man's wastewater into the Dead Sea. So these are the kind of thinking that we're now involved in, uh, and that's right now uh, on our table. So, so but that is uh, the direction. Uh, by the way, the Red Dead is, is dead. Uh, the option of the Red Dead is today dead. So it's, it won't come to be. So it's now, this is the name of the game. Again, I don't know if it will be, but that's, but doing some sort of feasibility study of this option is what we're now working on exactly on this type of proposal. Um, as for immigration, um, immig immigration, let's say it can be induced uh, because the, it's usually uh, mentioned about Syria. Uh, for example, that the civil war began because of water. Well, it did not begin really because of water. That's again something we have worked on. Um, it began because of uh, mismanagement uh, of water. That is, the Syrians mismanaged the water in the northeast by uh, having a wheat growing with their wheat, which is completely inappropriate in that part of the world, and increasing it all the time under a food security premise. The result of which, when the drought hit, they had all the, you know, all the reservoirs, including the aquifers, were empty. And and then in our part of the world, the name of the game is storage, because you need to store water from years of plenty to years of drought. And they mismanaged it. And then you got also a, a out migration. So again, it began with mismanagement. The out the result was out migration. So you do have such pressures. In, uh, in certain parts of the world. So it can force out migration. It is not a limit on in-migration really. I mean, let's say in, in Israel, you know, it's, it's, we had a huge migration wave in, in 1990 um, and, and the water situation, and we had droughts at the same time. And, and yet uh, we could manage it, it wasn't easy. But again, once you move, you kind of upscale it, you can address these kind of issues. Uh, but it again comes to the organization, to the governance, to the politics, uh, and, and the politics of water are tricky. Uh, and there's power elements there uh, which vary by place. And, you know, I, I won't give you the whole talk now because that will take all the time, but uh, uh, that's kind of the issues that come up. Thank, thank you for that. Um, I'm grateful for that answer and hopefully for our audience members, um, they appreciated hearing your insight on that topic. Um, I want to do a little bit of justice to kind of the second half of our topic around sanitation. I believe we've indirectly talked about it, but I want to make sure we have a moment to directly talk about it. Um, Sivan, if, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll begin with you as well. Um, so to the extent that, you know, you solve for the clean water on the front end, how would you in the village, um, uh, which quite frankly, you know, 50,000 as uh, an opportunity to change the lives of five to 10,000 people sounds like an unbelievable investment. Um, uh, what happens on the on this on the back half of that um, in terms of the sanitation, um, and then we'll we'll kind of go in turn and, and speak about that as well. Uh, let let me say, Zev, that we actually do not we don't do much for sanitation. That's the truth. Okay. We're only focusing on pumping water for 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 drinking, uh, for washing, for growing food, uh, and and. And of course, we, we have to do more. I agree with you. Um, but what we do see is once we give access to clean water to a village, to a population of 5,000 people, 
when we go back after a few months, truly everything changes. You see children, they are cleaner. They are going to school. Before they had to go and search for water, especially girls, but now they are going and getting education. People are healthier. They're drinking clean water. Less people are going to medical centers. But what inspires us the most is when we return to the village and we see the village is becoming rich so much. They are, they are creating so many businesses. They are making money. The main business is agriculture. So better nutrition, they make money, they sell uh, the extra uh, the, of the food, the vegetable in the market. The second business is making bricks. So earlier, Rich talked about housing. It's true. Once you give them water, they can build homes. They can make bricks. Truly, what I'm saying is that first and foremost, our focus is to do the minimum, provide clean water and just access to water to people. And that is already doing so much for the well-being of that population, better education, better health, and they're financially independent. Uh, so this is our focus. But of course, I agree with you that maybe we should take it a step um, further and, and deal also with the issue of sanitation. We will look into it. Yeah, no, I, I, um, I, I, was, I was more just genuinely curious. I, I think, you know, given a choice of um, investment and marshalling limited resources, I think you're, you're applying yourself uh, most appropriately on the critical scene that is necessary for these villages. So uh, by no means do I have a, 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 a contrarian opinion on that. Um, uh, I do have a couple of follow-up questions, but I'll, I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, uh, Rich, same, same, I guess, question to you if we think about sanitation. Um, uh, you guys are obviously operating worldwide. Um, and so maybe one initial question is, does the issue of sanitation vary by region? Are there, you know, different challenges in, I don't know, Asia versus Africa versus even parts of North or South America? And then kind of related, we heard a little bit about some of the complexities or maybe the, 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 the nuanced differences. Perhaps you can shine a light on how does um, kind of, you know, wastewater differ than kind of, let's say, clean water access? Or yeah. Yeah, thanks, Eve. Um, so, uh, you know, first of all, I'll just start by saying that uh, the sanitation challenge is um, in many respects uh, more widespread globally than, than the water, at least the basic water challenge, uh, just in terms of the sheer numbers of people that lack access to basic sanitation. Um, so, whereas water challenges, there are, there are kind of basic water challenges, and then they're more like say what they call safely managed water challenges uh, that vary a bit more by region, par partially as a result of geographic conditions, among other things. Uh, sanitation is, um, is very much still a worldwide problem in, in most of the world. Um, it's interesting, we call ourselves, you know, we refer to ourselves as water.org, uh, but 60% of the water and sanitation loans that have been made have been for sanitation purposes. So there's actually um, even more demand uh, for um, improved sanitation uh, than, than there is for improved water services in the places where we operate. And we operate in South Asia, Southeast Asia, uh, East, East Africa, and uh, parts of Latin America. Um, so it's, it's very much uh, on, on people's minds. Um, and there's very much uh, interest and demand uh, for sanitation improvements. I think when we look beyond the, the initial collection of sanitation, um, one of the key uh, challenges and issues in, in today with respect to provision is um, to what extent do we pursue uh, conventional centralized services where sewer sewerage based services um, in places like Iran mentioned that that um, where there's higher densities of population, uh, large populations uh, versus more decentralized um, um, options. Uh, the decentralized options uh, are certainly probably more relevant in rural areas, but also in peri-urban um, areas or areas where uh, that, that are urbanizing, but, but the cost of sewerage uh, relative to people's willingness and ability to pay um, is still very far out of reach. So um, there have been efforts to decentralize uh, sanitation services for those living in um, peri-urban areas or, or pockets of urban areas, but um, there's still quite of a challenge in terms of getting the, the governance and the management of, of those uh, services right and uh, ensuring that they are 
also linked with uh, the, the more conventional centralized um, sewerage options. Um, so that's an ongoing uh, issue and debate um, in the water and sanitation arena. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the waste, the wastewater side of things, uh, increasingly, um, uh, increasingly there is more investment happening. Um, in wastewater. Um, however, uh, it still lags behind, say, water treatment, um, for example. So there's still much, much, much to be done, um, especially in those rapidly urbanizing areas that, that, that Iran was um, referring to. Um, I, I think that there continue to be opportunities for um, wastewater recycling, as, um, as Iran mentioned, but also uh, looking at reuse. So um, some, there, there's some interesting new, newer models coming up in terms of using waste and generating it uh, to energy purposes and also for uh, as agricultural inputs that are starting to emerge. Um, they're still probably more in the pilot demonstration stage um, by and large, but I think over the next 10 years, um, you're gonna see more and more people um, placing capital and investment into those areas um, to take what's effectively a waste byproduct and turn it into something that's more of a productive input um, in, the, uh, in the economic process. Are you saying fertilizer is the future? It's part of it. Yeah, I think so. So um, we're, we're just down to our last few moments and I'm hoping to ask uh, two questions, Tom, and, and we will ask us of everybody. Um, and so perhaps um, we can begin, uh, uh, Professor Fadelson, with you. Uh, short, short answer, we'll ask all three of you in turn. Um, as you look a little bit uh, ahead into the future, say the next kind of three to five years, um, might you be able to make a prediction for us? Is there something perhaps on the horizon that you think may or may not transpire, but uh, if nothing else, maybe it's perhaps a little bit uh, provocative um, as we uh, reflect on this topic. And that'll be the same question for all three of you. Yeah, well, uh, one thing that, uh, as I mentioned, is happening is, is the widening of uh, the diffusion of desalination. I mean, we will see more desalination. There's no way around it. And desalination changes the game in the sense that water comes from the sea inland and not the other way around. So when we talk about all the history of water and geography of water, I know it always was the water goes to the sea. Well, now we flipped it over. So this is something that is happening and we will flip water and then water becomes something that you convey because it's uh, usually we talk about water, you know, flowing down, et cetera, et cetera. Once you talk about desal, water flows upland. It flows. Uh, the problem is that, you know, it's, it's the adage that uh, water flows to money uh, and, and that is part of the problem. So, so I think the challenges are how do we address really the, the water poverty? How do we address uh, uh, these kind of issues? Uh, to say that I know how it will be done, I, I think the awareness is going up, which is critical because you need the more funds uh, to go into it. And uh, the fact that funds, if funds go into it, then one can talk about a, a wider issue. The other point is really, uh, continuing from what Rich said, is, is the sanitation challenge. And, and the sanitation, one must remember, it has several stages. I mean, there's the collection system, and the collection system actually creates a pollution problem. And there's a difference between humid areas and arid areas. Uh, in arid areas, you want to reuse and, and recycle, et cetera. In humid areas, you put it back into the river and that's a pollution issue. And so it, you, one has to separate these kind of, of issues. In, in humid areas, generally, uh, things are usually better off. Uh, uh, in arid areas, the, uh, the challenge of recycling is, is much greater. Uh, and, and I think the big challenge is whether we'll be able to get to a wider scale recycling in the arid areas where the source is the urban. Uh, so, so the whole change of water will be that, I mean, which is what today we say in Israel, that the main source of water comes from the urban sector. That is because we desalinate into the urban sector, the urban sector is the source for the, uh, for the irrigation. So the whole system is, uh, the urban is a source of water and not just the consumption side. So this kind of, of thinking, I think, is, is, uh, will be wider spread. It will not solve all problems. It's, you know, the areas that Sivan is working on, it will not address their problem. But uh, in, in larger and larger parts of the world, I think this would be the kind of name of the game that will be going on. Thank you so much for that. Um, 
Rich, uh, kind of same question. Um, we'll, we'll try to get through this, if you don't mind, uh, briefly, and then we'll have one last, last question. So as you look to the future, kind of a prediction, bold prediction, um, kind of on the topic. Well, Iran said that water uh, tends to flow to money, and and it's funny because I think we want money to flow to water, mm. so <laughs> so we are looking. Well, he at, talked uh, about reversing it from one direction, maybe in your exactly case, right, right, again. yeah, Good. because because we certainly believe that uh, that funding and investment is required across the board um, in order to to meet uh, our our universal goal of, of of water and sanitation access for everyone. Um, Prediction wise, uh, so so I so we think about it, you know, globally, and and you know, if we think about sustainable development goal number six, which basically um, has a goal of universal um, water and sanitation uh, safely managed uh, services for everyone by 2030. That's a very aspirational goal at this point, given where we are. Um, my hope and my prediction is that we will get to the basic uh, water uh, part of that goal by 2030 so that everyone will have at least some access to basic, what's considered basic water services. I don't think we will get to the sanitation goal. Um, and I don't think we will get to the safely managed standard for, uh, for water um, by mm. 2030. I still think that there's a lot more work to work to be done, um, investment to be made, and uh, models that can really generate that degree of impact. Um, but um, hopefully we can get to the, um, the basic water uh, universal coverage standard by, by 2030. Thank you for that. Sivan, same question. I think truly that uh, it will just get worse unless people understand the importance of energy. If we start focusing on energy first, then people will have access to water and then better education and everything else. But mm. energy should be the focus because otherwise you cannot pump the water. There is no mm. other way than pumping it, especially where we operate in Africa. There are 54 countries in most of the countries over 60% of the population doesn't have access to water. And so it's a challenge. Most of them are living in rural Africa. So we, we have to focus on finding simple solutions and focusing first on uh, producing energy to pump water. I think yeah. this is our challenge. Thank you, Thank you for that, yes. See, Ivan, can I just uh, can I just briefly respond to that? Because I agree that energy is an important input. Um, however, um, there are uh, the reverse. I think is also true. Um, there are places that rely on hydro hydroelectric dams to to uh, demonstrate and generate energy. Um, there's parts of the United States that are living in a, a drought, a mega drought of that's going on several hundred years now, um, where water levels are at historic lows. So without water conservation, uh, without water in the system, there's no energy that can be generated um, in those cases. So I think I think it goes both ways, that nexus that you're talking about. That's a really, really great point. Um, so in our, in our last final moment, um, uh, Sivan, we'll begin with you. If you had one wish or one ask of the audience, what would you what would you want? What is what is your wish for the audience? And all three panelists will uh, will do the same in, in, in conclusion. Well, I truly wish that we will not have to speak about it in the near future, because then it means that everyone will get access to clean water, which is so basic. So that is really my wish. And for those who are listening, I would like to say that uh, it doesn't take much to help others. It really doesn't. Uh, and it is important. So I'm very pleased that they're interested in the issue of water. It is crucial. So I would like to thank them for that. Very good. Professor Fadelson, if you don't mind, one, one ask or wish, if you will, for, from the audience listening here. Well, I think the main thing is, is really the awareness, first of all, of uh, the centrality of uh, the water and sanitation, really of the sanitation side of it, and particularly uh, the treatment of uh, wastewater. That is something that uh, has to really, it's kind of below the radar, you know, it's not uh, sexy. Uh, and and it's it's something that really has to we have to focus on much more uh, about this part of the water cycle. Thank you so much, Dr. Thorsten. Uh, a wish or an ask of the audience. Yep. Um, so completely agree with uh, Iran and and, and Sivan, um, especially about the benefits, the, the many benefits of water and sanitation and energy um, as well. Um, 
uh, on the awareness side, um, maybe I'll, my simple request is that uh, uh, our co-founders, uh, Gary White and Matt Damon, just released a book yesterday um, that mm. described their experiences, uh, how they came together, how they've come together, and the various partnerships um, that uh, they've, they've created and learned from along the way. Um, it's called The Worth of Water, um, and it's available in, in stores now. So uh, if you have an opportunity and you're interested, um, go buy the book and read more about um, their perspective on the water and sanitation crisis. Amazing. And so I'll take uh, the moderator's prerogative to uh, offer some maybe summary. Um, I'd love to uh, end where we began, which is to acknowledge uh, Hebrew University and the American Friends of Hebrew University in honor to participate alongside the three luminaries here. Uh, my wish would be one that uh, we never find ourselves in need um, and on the other side of this water equation. Um, and for those of us who don't think about water on a daily basis, perhaps something today motivated you to um, acknowledge perhaps the privilege that we have. And if we're in a position to do so, consider sharing that privilege, be that financially um, or otherwise with others who may not be in the position that we're in. Um, and then uh, just a, a simple wish, there's a Hebrew saying, next year in Jerusalem, Shana Bab uh, We are virtual because of uh, COVID, unfortunately, but perhaps next year we'll all be live, be that New York, perhaps in Jerusalem or somewhere else in the world. And so uh, hopefully we uh, uh, resolve some of the geopolitical issues that we're seeing we solve some of the water access and sanitation issues as time goes on. Uh, we begin with the African proverb, if you wanna go fast, um, go alone. Perhaps we as a community can go far and go together. Thank you so, so much. Uh, please enjoy the rest of your conference and thank you again to my esteemed panelists.